So I'm going to talk about rights. Uh, pretty big topic. I'm going to just talk about maybe two main approaches that one can take in sort of justifying rights. Uh, but I want to begin by like, trying to get myself in a little bit of trouble because I hear classical liberals and libertarians talking about natural rights a lot. They seem to you know, tend to like natural rights. And I've studied like, political philosophy for you know, quite a while, several years at least. And I still I don't know exactly what the hell natural rights are, really. I don't really know exactly what they are. Um, so instead, I thought what I'd do is sketch a couple of approaches that I think maybe I at least have a better grasp on as far as ways in which we might derive rights. One is this consequentialist approach, uh, and the other is what I'm going to call it, well, what is called a deontological approach. I know it's not generally a good idea to begin to talk by throwing out some isms, some big scary words, um, but I just did. And so uh, now that that's out there, I think what I'll do is sort of dive in a little bit and talk about sort of what is sometimes called a consequentialist view. Or here I'm going to use it interchangeably, the more familiar sort of utilitarian view. The reason I use consequentialist, it's sort of a broader term, applies to more things. I'm not going to split hairs though and explain why. If you have a question on it later, perhaps we can talk about it. But I'm going to sort of talk about that First, you know, a lot of economists here, and economists tend to like consequentialism, but I'm not going to like sort of ha ask for a, a, a poll or anything, but how many of you are familiar with the term consequentialism? All right, so all right, about half of you have heard about it. This is an unrelated point. Uh, how many of you have sort of taken philosophy classes before? It's a lot of you. Shit, I, have to, I can't make this up then. All right, all right. <laughs> All right, I'll have to throw this out then. I'll just have to like go with the standard. Anyway, um, so I think what I'm going to do is start out by telling a story that some of you, a version of which you may have heard before, uh, and this sort of falls within the consequentialist camp. I'm going to start out by being a little uncharitable to consequentialism, and then try to build something a little nicer and more charitable out of that. Okay, so. Little story. I'm gonna tell a little story. You're, there's a hospital, right? And there are five people who are dying. They all need a vital organ, a different vital organ, or they're gonna die. They're gonna be goners. Okay? These five people are like they're amazing. They've like they're you know inventors. They're captains of industry. They're great artists. Whatever. I mean, your your favorite. You're like you imagine your most heroic person who's like made you know so many people's lives better materially, spiritually, what have you. Well, these five people are dying. And there's like no, there's just there's not like a reserve of organs available for these people. But, but there's this guy Kenny who like works at the hospital. He like refills the vending machines and stuff. And it turns out that Kenny has he's like a, he has fresh, healthy organs, and they happen to be like perfect matches for these five people. Okay, well, a little far fetched, I know, I know, but hear me out. All right. Just turns out that you know Kenny has the, the you know has some organs that he that, that they could use. Well, a doctor somehow gets wind of this, right? And it's like, okay, well, look, we have these five people who have done all these amazing things, and if we save their lives, they're going to do a lot more amazing things, we can bet, all right? We have those people, you know, maybe potentially millions of people are going to benefit, have benefited and will continue to benefit if these people are saved, right? And then there's Kenny. And you know, he, Kenny's a nice enough guy, but... He's not really that ambitious. He's not terribly bright. He's probably just gonna, you know, maybe he'll just be content to refill vending machines the rest of his life or whatever. He's kind of a loner too. He doesn't have a lot of friends or family, you know. So the doctor gets to thinking, you know what? Um, what if I could just like you know maybe quickly, painlessly kill Kenny and use his organs to help save these amazing heroic people that are you know touched our lives and they're going to benefit us all tremendously. You know, why not? Why not do that? And let's, you know, I, the telling the story, it's already a little far-fetched. Um, let's assume that the doctor is able to do this and can you know, kind of get away with it and just kind of hide Kenny's. He, he just kind of disappears. Nobody ever really figures out what happens to him except the people who know. All right? So then, you know, like I said, he's kind of a loner. His friends, family, they're not going to miss him that much. So, <laughs> I know that's sad. I know it's pathetic and sad, you know. But he has really cool sideburns, though, we'll say. I don't know. He's, <laughs> he's got that to offer. Um, okay, so... Is there a plausible argument that it could be right, morally right, or at least permissible for the doctor to kill Kenny, save all these other people, bring a lot more value into the world? Yeah, there's the cost, right? We, we lose Kenny, 
So we put that, put that over in the cost column, right? But there's the benefits too. We save these amazing people's lives. And they go on to do all these other wonderful things that they never would have done if, uh, you know, Kenny's organs didn't save them. Okay, so yeah, weird story. Kind of unrealistic, far-fetched story. Philosophers, as uh, some of you probably know, like to tell weird, far-fetched stories. Uh, but some of you might be thinking, well, look, this is such a, this is such a far-fetched event. What relevance does it have, right? What, what, what's the point of this story, right? Something like this probably wouldn't really happen, right? It's, it's kind of unrealistic. Well, I think that telling a story like this can have a function. Uh, mainly, or one function it can have is to uh, kind of test um, whether some view should be rejected in principle or whether uh, maybe it's just not a feasible view. Okay, that's sort of a different thing. So that's one thing you could say, well, you know, consequentialism, it's a view that I'd accept in principle, but it's not something that maybe would work very well in practice. Okay, um, that's one possibility. Um, re a related point, if a view that you're sort of testing against a weird story, a weird example, if it can sort of survive that view and look good uh, through the course of telling even this somewhat far-fetched scenario, that's, a, that's some good, good evidence that maybe this view has some staying power. It's not conclusive evidence, but it's evidence that perhaps, hey, even in these sort of odd cases, the view doesn't seem so bad, it doesn't seem so weird, it doesn't bother us that much. Okay? So... Bracketing that for a second now, bracketing that story. What's the rationale for consequential? Why do, why do consequentialists defend the view or a view that morally right actions are those that bring about more overall good than other relevant alternatives? Right? What's the rationale for this? Well, here's one possibility. Health is a good. We value it. We, other than, you know, most of us, almost all of us value health. Right, uh, wealth. Most of us value prosperity, having you know material well-being, material comfort, personal excellence. Right, we value it perhaps intrinsically for its own sake, uh, as well as for all the good things that you know having these certain excellences can bring about. These are all good things. These are all valuable things. So, why not have more of them? Right, more of a good thing is generally better than less. So, why not bring about more health, more wealth? more personal excellence, or whatever your favorite values are. Those are just examples I'm using as for illustration. But, you know, whatever. Whatever particular values you think are important, good. Consequentialism is basically arguing, well, if it's feasible, let's bring about more of it. Right? If killing Kenny is the price we pay for bringing about, saving the lives of these people that are going to bring about so much more good, isn't that at least on the table as an option? Right? So that's one of the rationales, right? Bringing about more good stuff rather than less of it. Who could oppose that? Don't the ends sometimes justify the means? So going back to my story, I would say that the doctor that I painted, the one who kills Kenny painlessly and saves the lives of these five other people, um, this doctor is thinking in terms of, I would think, a rather crude consequentialism, okay? Um, and this kind of somewhat more crude view is one that holds that, let me, let me do a little bit of writing now, um, an action is right if and only if it maximizes the good. And then I'm going to tack on this little uh, perhaps weasel phrase, all things considered. You know, assuming it's feasible, you know, but we might have information constraints and so forth. So that's sort of what's packed into that all things considered phrase. Okay, so an action is right if and only if it maximizes the good. That's generally what a consequentialist view holds is that Morally right or wrong, morally right actions are those that bring about most overall good. Those uh, are, that are wrong are those that tend to decline or, or, or uh, diminish the good. All right. So, 
This is sort of the terms in which I think the doctor is thinking. And it's important here that we've, we highlight on action. I'm going to come back to this in, the, in a second. But the doctor's thinking in terms of, in this particular instance, what action should I take that maximizes the good? Okay? This view, the one that focuses on actions, is sometimes called act consequentialism or act utilitarianism. You've, some of you have probably heard of that term. All right. I forgot the M. Got to get the M there. Okay. So we have a tension here. I hope some of you sense that there's a tension here. I don't know. Maybe some of you are gung ho consequentialists. But I, you know, on the one hand, we have a moral theory that seems plausible at a certain level of generality, right? I mean, who would be opposed to bringing about more good stuff, right? I'll hold on a second, then I'll finish this up. On the other hand, yeah, it's fine. You have the view at a certain level of generality, but here it has an implication that I think would bother most of us. We, namely, you know. You, end up, you can end up going to a hospital and having your organs taken from you, right? That sucks. I don't think that anyone would really want a world where hospitals do this, right? So it seems like one of the problems here, and this is tying in with the theme of this talk, Kenny doesn't, Kenny doesn't seem to have any rights whatsoever. It seems like you know, it's very hard to, to, to sort of make room for people having rights in a world where we're supposed to, at any moment, try to max, you know, look at actions that maximize the overall good. Right? I mean, Kenny doesn't seem like, he seems to lack rights. He has no say on what is done to him if the distribution of benefits and costs happens to call for his sacrifice. Right? What, you know, if, if, if that's morally what we ought to do, then where do rights fit into that? Right? Where do rights fit into that? Okay? So, what gives? You know, what gives? Do we bite the bullet? Do we say, well, you know what? If consequentialism is the right way to go, if this is the view that seems most plausible at a level of generality, we're just going to have to buy, you know, buy into the bad consequences that come from it. Or, so, you know, I'm sorry, buy into the bad implications that come from it. Because overall, we're trying to bring about the best overall consequences. That's one possibility. I mean, bullet biting is an option. You can say, yeah, I know it's going to have some you know, sucky implications, but that's just how it goes. Right? Stand up for your premises. On the other hand, another strategy, a different one, might be to help out the consequentialists and argue, well, you know what? The story I've told is just a red herring. It's just not something that's going to be a feature of a world where a plausible consequentialist view predominates. Okay? And I kind of want to take that latter approach and see where we can go with it. Okay? Um, was that uh, the guy who had, you had your hand up? Did, was this a quick clarificatory question? or? Okay. Uh, yeah, maybe we can talk about it like Q&A or whatever. Okay. So, here's one way out. I think here's one way we can help out. Be, be, start being a little nicer to the consequentialists and not you know, being uncharitable like I've kind of been so far. Um, I think one way out is to claim that at least one person from the story I've just told is, is not an agent like us. All right? And I have in mind the doctor. Right? Um, the doctor who kills Kenny, I wager, is not a doctor we would tend to encounter in real life. Even somebody who would give that a serious thought, let alone act on it. Okay. Um, I don't know. Maybe House would do this. I don't know, but <laughs> maybe Dexter would do this. But he's Dexter a doctor? I, even, I don't watch Dexter. I don't know. Anyway, okay. But why is it that we won't encounter? You know, why is it that we don't encounter doctors who would be willing to, you know? if the chips fell just right, do something like this. Maybe it's the case that most doctors are just not performing their moral obligations because they're too squeamish, right? If morality demands that they do this to kill Kenny and they sort of refuse to do it, maybe they're being, you know, squeamish, self-indulgent. I don't think that, uh, though. I, I don't have that intuition at all. I think that if almost all people, after reflection, would have enormous reservations doing what some theory claims they ought to do, something's probably wrong with a theory and not with most people. Okay. Um, now you all can push back on that during Q and A if you if you think that that's just you know where am I getting that intuition or it, it, you don't share it at all. But I want to throw that out there. Okay. Um, I mean, just as a you know, sort of a sociological point, I don't think hospitals could last if they were the kinds of places where it was a you know even you know somewhat frequent occurrence where people would like disappear and then suddenly other people were healed magically, right? I think people start to get suspicious of this, right? There's just certain you know there's epistemic and, and and other evidential considerations that sort of tell against this being a realistic possibility. Okay, people you know places where people just disappear. I think people tend to avoid those, right? 
um, or set up a different hospital where people don't disappear. Right? Um, so those are some relatively superficial considerations. Here's a way out I think it may be much more helpful and, and, and may actually sort of paint a consequentialist view of a particular type in a more plausible light. Okay. Um, so far, the sort of consequentialist person we've been envisioning is, has been a person who's pursuing the good or pursuing goals, right? Well, it may be a pretty impoverished view of humans, at least, to only focus on their goal promoting features, right? We're not merely goal promoters, we're also rule followers. Um, we're rule followers. We, we act on norms all the time. Some of the, those that we aren't even consciously aware of a lot of times. Right? We're chock full of them. Um, you're walking down the street. You know, you're observing certain norms about how, you know, how, sort of playing chicken with other pedestrians. You know, how long before you kind of step aside or you kind of keep walking or whatever. It's like, hey, I'm walking. You know, you, like, they're taking up all the sidewalk or whatever. You know, there's all these little tiny sub-norms that we all work with. And uh, you know, just we're not even necessarily consciously aware of them. Um, and there are also rules that we probably are a little more consciously aware of. Rules like, and principles like do not kill, right? Um, those tend to be deep-seated in our psychology, um, such that pe most people can only break them with extreme difficulty, right? You know, you don't just kill somebody and then just like, oh, all right, back to my coffee, right? You, it would, if you killed somebody, even if you were justified in doing that, you would probably feel at least weird and kind of some kind of regret, some kind of bad, maybe, you know, all things considered, you shouldn't, but you, the fact that you do feel that means that the norm is kind of deep-seated in you, right? So, taking our psychological natures into account, sort of the full, of, you know, a more full range of our psychological nature, maybe instead of comparing which individual actions, oh, that's not going to work, which individual actions should bring about the most overall good, maybe instead we should look at which sets of rules or institutions or dispositions maximize the overall good relative to other alternative sets of, of rules or, or institutions or dispositions, okay? So this leads us to a sort of what is sometimes called rule consequentialism. So let me just get out of there and say a rule is right only if it maximizes the good, all things considered. So maybe a rule like do not kill would tend to maximize the good better than rules saying, okay, sometimes kill, or kill a lot, right? Um, so that's a possibility. I, I, I mentioned rules here, but I think it's also important to keep in mind dispositions, okay? If we internalize certain norms, they're dispositions. They're not just things we sort of step in and out of and act on fleetingly, okay? And I think, I, 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 Honestly, I can't emphasize that enough, I think, the importance of dispositions in our conduct. Um, we are creatures of habit. We are full of norms, and we act on them. And we can't step in and out of our dispositions as if they were just fleeting emotions or whims or just things that we do on a lark, right? So, um, you know, think of a disposition like love, right? Uh, creatures like us generally can't say something like, okay, I'm going to love my fiancé with all of my heart and soul, except on Tuesdays. Right? So it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Um, same goes with other dispositions, like inhibitions about killing. Right? You might be like, okay, well, I am deeply opposed to killing guy. I'm not going to kill a guy. All right? No, no, except maybe on Tuesdays. Right? And then I'm not so, you know, whatever. Maybe Tuesdays really suck. I don't know. But it's, that's just that's not how it works. Right? That's not how we are. Okay. And so here's me throwing out another intuition. Another sort of what I think is a platitude about morality, but maybe you disagree with this. But I think that any moral theory worth its salt must be able to take in into account our deep-seated features, or else it's just not a good view. It's not a realistic view. It's not one that works. If morality is fundamentally about how we can conduct ourselves, especially the social aspects of morality with regard to one another, it has to be able to take into account features that we can realistically expect people to act from. Okay, otherwise expecting them to act as saints or to do things that are that you, you sitting there probably would never imagine doing and then call them immoral if they don't do it, probably something wrong with the theory then, something wrong with the view. But again, maybe you disagree with that. Okay, so where is this headed? Well, 
Maybe this rule consequentialism, maybe one where they're, you know, they're, you know, it's good for a society to have rules like do not kill, um, do not violate another person's bodily integrity, do not steal another person's belongings, right? Maybe if these rules, societies with these rules tend to do better, maybe if there's group selection for these rules, right? Not among people, but among the norms, that cultures, societies that have these rules in place tend to do better than those that have different ones. Perhaps a really, you know, a story could be told that um, having these obligations sort of encoded in the form of rules that maybe aren't even explicitly consciously held in some cases, maybe those obligations then correspond to rights. Maybe we have a place now for rights. Harder to see back in the act consequentialist story, right, where Kenny was just sort of subject to being killed at any moment if the chips fell, right? But if we have rules and obligations against killing, against invasions of property or bodily integrity or what have you, then we can have a more sophisticated consequentialist defense of rights. There's a place for rights at the table. It's um, you know, mediated by the fact that we are rule-following beings, that we internalize certain rules, but that may be something that can get us rights. Okay? Now, these things I don't believe would be natural rights. Um, but they could have all the directive force that natural rights, I think, are purported to have by those who defend them. So there we go. Um, there could be room then. And I would think this is a definite improvement over some older consequentialist views, uh, such as those of, of Jeremy Bentham, who was an early 19th century utilitarian philosopher. Uh, his line on natural rights was that they are nonsense on stilts, quote, nonsense on stilts, right? I don't know if that was actually his view of rights as such, but if we go, you know, what I'm arguing here is if we go sort of a rule consequential direction, we could have, I think I've sketched maybe a way of getting rights that have a lot of oomph, that have a lot of directive force. Okay, so the end, I mean, is that it? How many of you are unsatisfied with that sketch of rights? And not just because I sketch it. Yes, yeah, okay, I've seen some hands here. Not really like, uh, you know. Anyone kind of like it, think it's promising? Anyone doesn't want, nobody wants, yeah, so it's a promising. I saw Chris, all right, that's excellent. That's a, no, say the little hands, all right. Some of you think this might be promising? Okay, I don't know. Um, maybe I didn't do a good enough job sketching it. I don't know, but I honestly, I'm kind of, yeah, you know. That's the, the technical term is yeah, like that about, uh, about the view. Not because, I mean, I think it's a really interesting view if, if you sort of buy a lot of the background premises that I think consequentialists are working with. But there's, I'm going to sort of step back now and, and look at some of those, okay? Those may not be the reasons that you, the problems that you might have with the view, but here's some, uh, some issue. I think a couple of concerns that I want to look at uh, that could be, deeper problems with any consequentialist view, even more plausible ones, ones that are more sophisticated, like the rule consequentialist view. Okay? So, here's the first concern I have. Um, I believe it's sketched on your outline, on your, on your handout, but I'm, I'm actually doing it in reverse order. Um, take a proposition like happiness is good. Happiness is good. Oh crap! I, no, right. Okay, that's a P right there. That's not a. You know, happiness is good. Okay. Looks like hacks. All right. Anyway, you, you get what I'm saying. Happiness is good. Um, seems like a straightforward enough statement, but I think it's ambigu amb ambiguous between at least two different propositions that are not necessarily compatible, that may well be incompatible with each other. Okay, so one way of interpreting that statement is to say, well, happiness is good full stop, right? Full stop. So, another way of saying that is, you know, happiness is impartial, or, or a good like happiness is impartial. Okay, so impartial, I'm going to call it the impartialist view. I'm, I'm, doing, yeah, I'm doing the horrible thing here in, in multiplying terms, uh, but it's sometimes called agent neutral view of goods. Okay, 
to say that goods are impartial. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's, let's take happiness first. On a sort of impartialist view, the happiness that resides in, what's your name? He, okay, um, I didn't hear that, so I'm going to make up a name, sorry. Um, ha- oh, yeah, sorry about that. Uh, so take Libby, my invisible friend Libby up here. The happiness that resides in her gives her as much reason to promote, or it gives me as much reason to promote it as it gives her reason to promote it. Okay, does that make sense? That's one example. A lot of times it doesn't, it, the headache example seems to work better a lot of times in, in cashing this out, so let me go with that. Um, so Libby has a headache. Um, and, you know, the, so the fact that she has this headache, this pain, gives me as much reason to relieve it as it gives her to relieve it, okay, on this impartial view. Because there's this, there's this pain. And on the impartial view, well, pain's a bad thing, we should get rid of it. So wherever it resides, wherever it's lying, we should get rid of it. And we have, I have as much reason to do it as she does, even though the pain happens to be residing in her head, right? So that's sort of an illustration of what they mean, uh, what, what uh, sort of this impartialist view means, okay? Well, that's not the only way of interpreting happiness is good, the, the, the more general statement. There's a different interpretation, one that could be incompatible with this. And that is, happiness is good for this or that agent. All right? So, Bill's happiness is good for Bill. Libby's happiness is good for Libby. It could be the case that Libby's happiness is good for Bill if he has his own reasons to want to bring it about. Maybe he likes her. Maybe he's uh, sympathetic and he likes strangers and he likes to bring about their happiness or something like that. But it's still his own personal reasons. Agent relative reasons. This is sort of an agent relative view of the good. The goods are only good fours. There's no such thing as an impartial good. So that does make these views incompatible. Okay? So, take the headache example. Um, On an agent relative view, the fact that Libby has a headache doesn't necessarily give me a reason to help her relieve it. Okay? I could have agent relative reasons to relieve it. Maybe I care about her and I don't want her to be in pain. That would be an agent relative reason. It, the reason wouldn't, the force of the reason wouldn't be coming from the fact that she has pain in her head. That's more of the, this uh, impartialist view, right? So yeah, maybe that's a reason I'd have to relieve her headache. Maybe uh, I don't really like her at all, but she's groaning from the pain, and I can't w- hear Miami Vice or something, you know. I, I, and so it's drowning out my my stories, my pictures, and I can't watch them. And so I give her like an aspirin and like, oh, you know, take this and please be quiet, right? That's an agent relative reason to help her. Not maybe not kind of a scroogey one, but you know, that's the reason. Um, well, here's the reason I bring up this distinction is because it seems like for consequentialists we're gonna tend to at some level, either first order, maybe second order, we won't get into that, um, view goods as impartial. Okay? If goods are agent relative, if they're indexed to agents, if all goods are good fours, then it's not at all clear how there can be an overall good to be maximized, an overall good to be brought about. Okay? And let me illustrate what that means by way of... uh, very, very, very simple math, which is all I can know how to do anyway. Okay, so take the impartial view. Let's say that, um, okay, I will use me as an example. I, get, I have, have 15 units of happiness right now. I, I'm giving my talk, I'm kind of having fun and stuff. Um, and then uh, Libby's in the audience. I don't know if there's anyone actually named Libby here. It doesn't mean I'm picking on you, but let's say that she's you know, kind of listening, but she's not having as much fun as I am, and she just only has 10 units of happiness. All right. Maybe she's thinking of drinking later or something, and that's making her even happier, but it's the 10 units of happiness, okay? So 10, 15 units of happiness in Bill, residing in Bill, 10 units of happiness residing in Libby, on an impartial view, you can add goods across persons. There's like a common currency, there's a common denominator. So that leads to 25 units of overall happiness, right? Okay, and if that's the case, then we have a story that you can tell about maybe why we ought to maximize that or something like that. You know, let's say there's some story we can tell about how goods can be added up most efficiently or, or uh, summing up to the largest number. Well, 
if goods aren't like that, if goods are agent relative, then it's not quite the same, right? Because what we have here now is 15 units of happiness for Bill plus 10 units of happiness for Libby adding up to what? Happiness for Liberty or happiness for Libby and happiness for Bill are not it's common currency. Two different things. They're indexed to two different people. How do you add those up? I mean, there's, there's not like a being called Bill Libby, you know, that there's 25 units of happiness for. Right? There's not like this new sort of fused conscious being or something that now you can add them up like that. Okay, we're separate. We're, we're, we're separate individuals. Right? I mean, this was John Rawls's critique of utilitarianism is that it doesn't take seriously the separateness of persons. Well, this is one way of perhaps cashing out the fact that maybe goods are not additive across persons. That you can't trade off utility across persons. You can trade off utility within persons, perhaps, or at least within the same selves. I won't go into the whole personal identity debate, but you know, along those lines. But when you're talking about different individuals, we could be that we have incommensurability here. Okay? So, that's one possibility. Now, I haven't, I haven't given anything like a conclusive, well, clearly then, there are only agent relative goods. I merely throw this out here as an alternative way of understanding the good. Okay? And so, if, so if, if a consequentialist, insofar as his view will depend upon there being impartial goods, uh, and he, you know, he wants us that are skeptical of that to accept the view, there will have to be an argument that shows why there are impartial goods or why maybe there are agent relative goods but they're also impartial goods or some kind of story along those lines, right? So there need, there would need to be an argument along those lines. And I mean, I'm not, I don't mean to say that consequentials haven't, you know, made attempts to, to, to give arguments for this. I don't want to say that. There's been lots of ingenious uh, you know, work in that area. Um, but I just want to point out that that's an issue that would need to be addressed. Okay, so that's the first concern. It's about the nature of the good. The second concern I have actually I, th I think is more important. Um, you know, the whole meta-ethical view about what the nature of the good is, that maybe is a story that we, you know, maybe we don't know. We don't have, maybe we don't have a, a, a conclusive thing to say in favor of either of these views. Who knows? We'll leave that aside. Let's assume we don't. My second concern is that consequentialism, I think, seems to miss some of the kinds of reasons we tend to evoke as fixed points of our moral practices. Okay, I'll tell you, I'll explain a little bit what I mean by fixed points as I sort of flesh things out, okay? Um, and so this is now, we're, we're kind of shifting away now by, by virtue of this concern, shifting more toward this guy, right? I think some of the worries you all might have or some of the dissatisfaction you might have with consequentialist views may stem from the fact that you have some deontological premises, but we'll see. You know, maybe you don't. Maybe you have different reasons for opposing it. Some of mine, though, some of my concerns with consequentialism come from having certain deontological premises. We'll get to that, what the, what the hell that means in a second. Okay. Um, so I'm going to invoke, uh, how many of you have heard of the uh, term reactive attitudes? Okay. Nobody. Good. Now I can make these up. Well, I know some people in the back have, but. Uh, so basically what reactive attitudes are, they're, uh, they're moralized or moral emotions, okay? So they're things like blame and resentment and guilt and indignation, right? I notice I'm just going to focus on like the negative ones. I'm not going to focus on like the fluffy positive ones or anything like that because that's not as much fun. Um, but blame, indignation, guilt, resentment, these are emotions that are moralized, okay? They, they, they have some kind of moral content to them, right? Uh, as opposed to, an, and I'm, I'm, def, I'm sort of coming at this by way of examples without defining things up front, right? Um, but so to contra contrast those, uh, an emotion like sadness isn't, um, isn't clearly a, at all a, sort of a moral emotion. It's maybe a response to losing something important or valuable, but it doesn't necessarily have what we tend to think of as moral content to it. Whereas guilt tends to be sort of inherently moral concept. You, you feel like you've done something wrong or you've violated some important norm or precept, right? Where you know sadness, that kind of feature is absent, right? Um, so, 
I'm going to tell another story. Is that all right? I'll tell another story a little bit. All right. Um, so I'm wait this is exciting. I'm waiting for a bus. Okay, you do that a lot in D.C. and stuff like that. So I'm waiting for a bus. Um, and Kenny walks up uh, and sticks a, f well, he, the original story is he sticks a fork in my neck, like bam, right, right in my, you know, right in my neck. He just, bam, it's a total stranger. Uh, the, but I, since it came up, maybe he sticks a giant dollar sign in my neck or something. I don't know. I mean, whatever. He brandishes some kind of weapon. I'll stick with a fork, though. Okay, so, he, oh, right in my neck, I start bleeding, you know, carnage, carnage, blood, whatever. I'm feeling pain, I'm feeling humiliation, too, because you know, it's like I'm at, the, everyone's kind of like, hey, you know, they're at the bus, they're like yelling at me, like, hey, don't bleed on me, right? I'm feeling kind of humiliated, because I'm feeling, you know, all this pain and stuff, you know, reacting like this, okay? That's not all I feel, though, right? I feel also a great deal of blame and resentment toward Kenny for doing this to me, Right? I don't just go like fiddlesticks, right? That's unfortunate, right? I, you know, I feel I'm, I'm pissed at him, right? I'm pissed at him. And if you could capture my reactive attitudes in words, it would probably be something like, how dare you do this to me? And this is important. I'm addressing him. I'm saying, how dare you do this to me? I don't say like, oh, that's unfortunate that this person did this to me. You know, I'm, it's not like that, right? Now, I believe in this case my reaction is warranted. I believe, you know, my, my reactive attitude is a warranted one. It's a, it's a warranted attitude. But what warrants it? Okay? Maybe it ultimately at the end of the day isn't something that I'm warranted in feeling. Um, but here's a stab. When I feel, I get it stabbed, anyway. When I feel a deep anger toward Kenny for what he did to me, um, well, let me, this is actually a prefatory question. Is it because, you know, when I feel deep anger at him, is it because I feel like he brought about less overall good in the world, you know? Is that really like the source of my moral anger at him? Um, this is, so I'm trying to get like another jab in at consequentials. No, I don't think that's even like a part of, like even in the ballpark of what I'm feeling. Maybe it is the case. If there is such a thing as the overall good, he, he, maybe his doing that reduces it. Maybe I should feel, you know, if I should be a, somewhat of a consequentialist, yeah, maybe I should feel a little bit about that. But that's not like the, the crux of my anger. Right? The crux of my anger is that he is like, you know, he's messed me up, right? And disrespected me. Right? Now so that's the thing. I mean, so so it, it seems like there's there's features of rightness and wrongness of actions or or what have you that are separate from or separable from considerations having to do with their bringing about the most overall good. Okay, so the consequentialist view says that rightness and wrongness is only a function of what brings about overall good. But this guy, the deontological approach, sometimes de you know, called deontology, manages to avoid an ism here. Just get an ology to it. Okay, well, that view holds that the rightness or wrongness of an action is sometimes separable from whether that action brings about, promotes good or bad results. All right? Now, this is an important aside, um, just to avoid any confusion. It's not that consequences never count on a deontological view. That would be crazy. Consequences are, can be often very important for a deontological view, but they're not always the only things that matter when it comes to the moral rightness or wrongness of an action. Okay? So, why do I feel resentment toward Kenny when he stabs me? Um... Well, here's, you know, here's a thought. Maybe one view is that in order to be part of a functioning society, um, we regard one another as free and equal, basically free and equal. And we have certain shared norms that have emerged that more or less capture these attitudes. Again, maybe there's a story for why there was a selection for these norms, that, that groups that act on these norms tend to do better than those that don't. That's, you know, I'm kind of armchairing things here. There's a lot of good empirical and anthropological research that is being done and remains to be done on how and why is it that we come to have a lot of the norms we have, right? But, you know, hear me out on that. So, here's a, you know, here's a thought. Maybe when I make a demand on Kenny not to stab me, I am holding him accountable for his action, right? Um, as a member of my moral community, as somebody who is part of this realm of shared norms, uh, and in so doing, I'm addressing Kenny as, as my equal. So there's a sense in which when you get really pissed at somebody, you're showing them respect by doing that, right? Does that make sense? Because you're basically saying that you're, they were above acting the way they did. You know? If that makes any sense. I don't, I'm not going to follow that thought too far because I'm running short on time. But 
There's a, there's a sense there. You're holding somebody accountable as an equal. If you can't even bother to feel anger towards somebody, you probably hold them in such contempt that you don't regard them as in some sense you're equal. So, but I said that hastily, so maybe you all want to push back on that point. Okay, so should Kenny stab me? I blame him, and I'm not just blaming him the way like, okay, so I have these birds that are roosting outside my house, and they make a lot of noise, and they poop on everything. I, I, they, I hate them. I want, I want them to die because they, they suck. Right, and I yell at them. I yell at these birds to get out of my, stop roosting in my house. Right, and but when I yell at them, I'm not trying to induce guilt in them. Right, I'm not trying. I'm not blaming them. That's not describing what I'm action. I'm just trying to startle them and make them go away and, you know, bother somebody else. When I yell at Kenny, right, I'm blaming him. That's, that's part of the, the action. I'm, I'm blaming him, um, and I'm expecting him to feel guilt. I don't expect birds to feel guilt. Right, uh, but I expect Kenny to feel guilt for what he has done. That he is what he's done is beyond the pale. Okay, I expect him to feel guilt because he has failed to hold himself up to our shared conceptions of one another, our shared accounts of one another. Okay, and these counts, these these norms that we share, they're useful. They're mutually advantageous. They tend to be right. Society where people don't stab each other tends to get along better than one in which people can just walk up and go, "Hey, you know, like that." Right, right. So one way of putting it might be to say that these these reactive attitudes that we have of blame come about. Um, and uh, are useful precisely because we endorse them. They have staying power. Maybe the causal story for how they came about differs from why we still invoke them. But that's, uh, that's fine. Okay? And so a reactive attitude such as blame, such as uh, indignation, resentment, toward real or perceived disrespect is, I think, a fixed point of our social practices. Right? It's an indelible part of who we are as at least non-psychopathic persons, right? Psychopaths, a whole other story. I haven't brought them in. I'm going to leave them out, right? Somebody's laughing. But, uh, you know, if, if we're talking about psychopaths, I don't know. If, uh, larger point, way background point, I don't know if we can talk a psychopath into acting morally, right? If they don't have a conscience, if they don't have these, these uh, moral emotions, okay? Also, we can't reason our way out of Reactive attitudes, they're, they're pretty potent, right? You can't just sort of talk yourself out of it. I mean, there are cases where you could uh, maybe revise your assessment of whether you should have reacted in such a way. I mean, there, there are considerations that might excuse or exempt the one for whom we originally felt resentment. So let's say it turns out that Kenny, uh, you know, I, like, I'm, I, I'm on the, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital with the fork still in my neck, and the paramedic is like, oh, yeah, I've been hearing stories about like, these flesh-covered robots that have been like, misprogrammed in the city and they've been like stabbing people, right? If it turns out that Kenny's like a flesh covered robot who doesn't have like, he's not, he doesn't have a conscience or anything like that, then maybe I have to revise my assessment of, you know, his blameworthiness. Maybe there's no person there to blame, right? But those, you know, or maybe he's just batshit crazy. Maybe he's just insane. He doesn't know what he's doing, right? He's a person, but he doesn't know what he's doing. Maybe that means I can't, you know, I have to revise my assessment of, of his blameworthiness, right? Things like that. Okay, so. Said a lot about this. Where do rights fit in? Um, I think one story that we could tell is that at least many of the basic moral rights that we, we have or take ourselves to have uh, or recognize each other as having, uh, they capture sort of ineliminable ways of how we conceive of one another in ourselves. And perhaps, you know, so why is there a right to bodily integrity? Why is that so common in uh, sort of liberal democracies? Well, maybe we've been raised to regard ourselves as autonomous and having discretion over the most intimate aspects of our personhood. How much time I have, Jeff? Five minutes? Okay, cool. Um, so, why is there a right to liberty? Well, maybe we've been raised to regard ourselves as self-authenticating sources of valid claims. That's a fancy way of saying, I'm borrowing from Rawls again, that's a fancy way of saying that we take our reasons for actions as defaults, okay? That when we're acting, we take our reasons for actions as defaults, and anyone who interferes with our actions, whether physically or through trying to blame us and make us feel guilt, um, that person needs to bring to the table reasons that we're committed to endorsing based upon our own beliefs and values. And that's, uh, there's a lot packed into that. I'm just sort of throwing that out there as a possibility, as a way in which we kind of think of ourselves. Okay? We can talk about that more if you have questions or, or uh, there's things that aren't clear there. Okay, so on this view, this sort of this one version of this deontological approach that I've been talking about, um, rights are kind of close to home in a sense. They're um, they're not you know they're they're 
not extremely derivative ethical concepts like they are on, on some views, right? So they're not like, you know, they're not demonstrated as conclusions to the long chain of proofs that are based upon, you know, like a, like a rich ethical theory, which in turn is based upon a deeper philosophical system. Um, I mean, that may be one way to write. Maybe in the end that's the only way we can verify them. But my, my sense here is that they're a lot closer to home and they don't require that systematic a justification. Some of you may regard that as deeply problematic um, for this account that I admit that I've only sketched. So if there is a problem there, we can certainly discuss that. Um, and again, I don't know if these things that you know, I'm calling rights here are are natural rights, because I still don't quite know exactly what natural rights are supposed to be. But maybe they have, again, the directive force that we people who support natural rights like them to have. Um, but I'm sure you'll have lots of questions and doubts about those matters. Um, I do think, though, I'm going to pound the table here a little bit, and I say I think we are all deontologists at heart, even if you don't acknowledge it. Um, in a way of testing your skepticism to that, I'm not going to do it. I mean, I'm not going to test your skepticism by stabbing you. with a, I'm not going to fork stab you. Um, but I, I do know where Kenny lives, so... You know, that's just a thought. Yeah. Okay, so I've talked enough. Thanks. <laughs>